ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this uh, important session on the fourth industrial revolution. We have a great panel, uh, some of the most uh, insightful uh, people on uh, the power uh, of uh, the new uh, technologies uh, in the world and how we can apply these new technologies not only to increase competitiveness, but also in the interest of humankind. We uh, know that um, um, this fourth industrial revolution is happening at a pace that is unparalleled. The first industrial revolution that started uh, in uh, England uh, took 100 years to spread outside Europe. When we had the telephone, uh, it took 75 years to get uh, to 100 million people with a landline, 100 years. The internet has spread in uh, a decade and um, many people know um, have access, unfortunately uh, not everyone. In fact, 3.6 billion people don't have access to the internet yet, at least not um, with broadband, so it works extremely well. That's another initiative that we are working on. Uh, this is an initiative, the World Economic Forum. But today it is really about um, how we can make sure that the new uh, technologies uh, that we all are so familiar with, uh, artificial intelligence, internet of things, um, but also how we can use big data um, in um, a productive way so we can also uh, make our world more prosperous. And as uh, many of you know, the World Economic Forum has now 15 centers around the world related to uh, the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution. I was just in a meeting with uh, His Highness, the Emir of Qatar. We also discussed the uh, future possibility of a center uh, here in Doha. So let me then, uh, without any further do um, introduce uh, the panel um, here uh, to my right hand side. We have His Excellency uh, Mohammed bin uh, Ali Al Manai, Minister of Communications and Information Technology of Qatar. Welcome, Minister. And then um, we have um, the Honorable Minister Paula Ingabera, Minister of Information, Communication, Technology, and Innovation of Rwanda. And I'm looking forward to very much. Uh, uh, Paula to be in Rwanda uh, later this week where we're going to have the inauguration of our center in Kigali. It's great and uh, Inga is also, um, Paula uh, is then also a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum and that is the same with Patrice uh, Motsepe. He is also a board member of the World Economic Forum but also founder and executive chairman of African Rainbow Minerals and a big supporter of our center um, also in San Francisco. And last but not uh, least, Akim Steiner, Administrator of uh, UNDP, United Nations Development Program, um, also uh, very committed uh, to these new technologies and also a supporter of this Edison initiative that I just mentioned. World Economic Forum has brought together uh, many telecommunications um, companies and other companies with the aim of getting access to the internet uh, for the 3.6 billion people that have no access, at least not the access that uh, they should have. But let me uh, start with the host of the Doha conference and um, with Your Excellency um, Mohammed bin uh, Ali Al Manai. Uh, we know that uh, Doha has uh, developed a lot. You're no um, uh, kind of a docking station um, for also financial services. We know the incredibly important role of Qatar uh, in uh, natural gas and uh, LNG uh, as a bridge from a fossil fuel-based society uh, to a renewable society. So where, where do you see uh, Qatar uh, moving when it comes uh, to the new uh, technologies? What is your vision uh, for um, Qatar? Um, welcome, Minister. Uh, thanks, Paul, for uh, hosting us today. Uh, uh, and uh, just to give a vision about the future, maybe it would be good to recap on what has been done in the country. I think over the past 20 years, the country uh, has moved from 
or has moved in liberalizing the telecom market and has moved from uh, simple uh, IT based or simple technology use to a very much sophisticated. So today we see that the country in terms of uh, access, we have 99% fiber across country, 5G technology being rolled out. The data center has grown from one simple data center to a three data center uh, operator uh, operating 10 different uh, facilities that are hosting two of the hyperscale cloud service provider in the globe. Uh, we have invested a lot in submarine cable, satellite, uh, so we excel almost in every angle of infrastructure as if we speak today. So technologically as an infrastructure, we are very much ready and capable uh, as a country. Uh, and from government service point of view, we have moved from few government electronized services to more than 1,500 digitized government services as if we are sp speaking today. That actually left us with a big challenge about what's, what's next and how we can make use of uh, the new technologies that are uh, coming. And for that we are setting priority for ourselves and I would uh, speak about three main priorities that we are looking after. First is that how we can rescale the existing resources in order to cope with the fourth industrial revolution requirement. Uh, I think skilled resources is a challenge globally and uh, if we aim only that we will deploy technology and just bring new resources in, I think we will be mis doing a mistake. We should invest on equipping the existing skills and resources to meet the future uh, requirement. And I think the majority of our investment in the future would be for change management and equipping the existing resources uh, to cope with the technological change that's coming. And as a second priority for us as a country is how we can move the government services from being service centric or technology centric, if I would have to call it, to a citizen or business centric. Uh, that's a big change of how you make your services being delivered to consumer or, or to your citizens, which require a lot of work more than just simply saying moving from technology to a service centric, because here you would have to deal with uh, existing governance model that existed for so long, the legal framework, and also people of practices and how they are used to gain uh, the service. And the third priority for us is that, as I have said, we have excelled in uh, infrastructure, so we, ne we need to capitalize on that and make sure that we are getting the right return for it. Uh, so we are actually enhancing our legal regulatory framework uh, in, uh, in order to make that infrastructure usable by hyperscaler cloud provider and international companies in order to deliver their services, at least for the region, through Qatar as a platform for the region. I think we have done few success, uh, or we have few success cases there, uh, but uh, it's yet uh, to be open for the rest of the world in order to join us in this. Thank you. Shukran, uh, Minister. Um, then um, to um, uh, you, uh, Paula Ingebera, uh, Minister for uh, Information and Communication Technology uh, in uh, Rwanda. Um, firstly, congratulations on uh, having a minister with that kind of portfolio. We know that uh, um, President Kagame also is uh, very ambitious when it comes uh, to these uh, new technologies. And I know that you also formed a data policy um, uh, had a white paper on, on data policy um, uh, last year. So how can a developing country like Rwanda use the new technologies uh, in uh, its um, aspiration for uh, becoming a middle-income country uh, in the future? Uh, thanks, Borgen. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to be here today uh, with the rest of the panelists. And just speaking off on what you just mentioned, which is the data protection and privacy policy, which in many ways we've also benefited from, uh, you know, partnerships uh, such as the one that we have with the forum and leveraging that to be able to curate a policy or a law uh, that is relevant to how we see the processing and collection of personal data. And so this is an important step um, towards, um, you know, positioning Rwanda uh, as a digital leader uh, in the innovation space. And back to our, you know, vision of being a knowledge-based middle-income country, when you talk about knowledge-based, you can imagine it's the use of information of high-skilled 
to really um, you know, take the country to the next level. And so this uh, data protection and privacy law provides a necessary foundation um, that will transform uh, Rwanda into a data-empowered society. Uh, Minister Mohammed did, did talk about what the journey for Qatar has been uh, from investing in the right infrastructure, which is what Rwanda has done for the last 22 years, uh, building the necessary foundational infrastructure, which today has enabled us to have over 95% uh, coverage, population coverage. But then there still remains a gap, and Borge, you did speak to it when you mentioned, you know, more than 3.6 billion people that still remain unconnected. And much as we talk about coverage statistics, I think the other alarming statistics that every policymaker is grappling with is the usage statistics. And this is where we find data as a powerful tool to how we can bridge the gap uh, or the usage gap that we see. So the primary goal of our data protection and privacy law is to empower our citizens with agency over their, the use and collection of personal data. Uh, secondly, it's really to enable trusted and secure data flows, both domestically, regionally, and also internationally. But also, in many ways, as we position ourselves to become you know, uh, a leader in innovation, it provides regulatory certainty uh, for businesses, whether it's the local businesses with, with which we are trying to build capabilities for, or even international businesses that are looking to set up presence um, within Rwanda on the continent, giving them that regulatory certainty for the investments that they will be making. And finally, um, it's really accelerating our ambition to become an, a knowledge-based economy. Now, I just wanted to end off with, with, with just a couple of things. Um, when, when you look at the data governance frameworks, what does it help us to achieve? It's the balance between the benefits and risks of collecting and using personal data. And so even as we think about being a, a data-driven society, as we think about unlocking um, you know, service delivery, policy making, uh, business opportunities, new products, leveraging big data, it's very important to give that certainty over how uh, data is used, but also to build trust, consumer trust, because think about it, when you build trust, then citizens are going to use and leverage these digital tools more. And in turn, you're going, to, you're going to enable the different investments that need to be made by both the public and private sector to drive innovation. No, uh, thank you very much, and also congratulations on what you have achieved when it comes to connectivity uh, in Rwanda. Uh, Patrice uh, Motsepa, um, the founder uh, of um, African Rainbow uh, Minerals and the executive uh, chairman. Uh, Patrice, um, I know that uh, you have also focused a lot on um, the new te technology and how they also positively uh, can lead uh, to socio-economic development for the whole Africa in the pan-African uh, context. And uh, you have been also supporting uh, the work of the Fourth Industrial Revolution Centers uh, for uh, the forum. So would be very interested to hear where you see um, the technologies, what role it can play also for Africa becoming knowledge-based economies uh, in the future. Borge, uh, good to see you. I think it's... Uh, the World Economic Forum does very good work, you do good work, and the partnership with uh, Qatar uh, makes this uh, forum uh, in many respects because there's lots of discussions taking place worldwide in different parts of the world. But your partnership here from a for World Economic Forum perspective really makes this a focus area and brings uh, some of the most outstanding people globally. Uh, two fundamental issues. Uh, from an African perspective, there's a pure commercial, pure business imperative as far as technology is concerned. Uh, but there's also a, a pure human uh, socioeconomic upliftment. And one of my uh, prime concerns is the approximately 300 million young Africans between the ages of 15 and, and 24 to whom we have to give a future. The other thing that we must recognize is that uh, there's a lot of exciting things that are happening in Africa. Uh, you spoke about the World Economic Forum. We've been going to the World Economic Forum for the last 25 years, and you look at where Africa and the heads of state from Africa and the focus on Africa. Uh, initially, 
the, there was an article by The Economist that said Africa, the dark economy or the dark continent. And we have seen a distinct uh, increase in investment, improvement in people's standards of living. But Africa is still behind technology, uh, whether it's automation, robotics, but the fourth industrial revolution in its totality really presents an incredibly exciting tool to allow Africa to live from. Now we talk about these things and, uh, and the critical issue, if you look at uh, your center in San Francisco, the world-class work that the World Economic Forum is bringing and bringing some of the best brains in the world in technological advancements. So I am absolutely confident, I was listening yesterday when they were talking about all of these advances in uh, whether it's ed tech, technology in relation to health, technology in relation to agriculture, technology in relation to e-commerce, technology in relation to fintech, as well as what uh, President Kagame is doing in terms of the, 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 the exciting work that the government is, do, using, is doing using technology. So, so in conclusion, there's a need for a significant greater amount of investments. Uh, I mean, the, the companies that I'm associated with will be spending about $5 billion over the next uh, three to five years in investment, bricks and mortar, in Africa. Uh, we do business worldwide, in Asia, in America, in Europe. Uh, we've got investments in uh, South America, but for us, the best place to be is Africa. And the most exciting area in terms of investment is how technology, and, and uh, whereas the best technology in the world is still, as a matter of fact, from Silicon Valley, as well as from parts of Europe. Of course, China is now also making great technologies. We want to encourage Africans to develop African technology that is uniquely positioned to take to make use of the exciting opportunity. So, so I'm saying in conclusion that, uh, you know, let's keep, keep an eye on Africa. And this thing that Africa needs help and Africa will grow because of aid and because of donations. I mean, no economy in the world has grown because of aid, because of donations. I mean, we, through the Family Foundation, have a huge obligation to give back to the continent that has made us. But it's about entrepreneurship. It's about private sector, partnership with governments, what you and Klaus called the uh, public-private uh, partnership, which is a basis for the future. But I'm excited and confident, and technology will indeed change the face of the African continent. Thank you so much, um, Patrice, and thanks for your kind words. Uh, I really um, appreciate what you said about um, that for, for your companies, uh, the best place to be is in Africa. And um, we also have to see development of African technologies. But the prerequisite for leapfrogging is also access to the internet, access um, to the competence. And here I think Akim uh, Steiner comes in, uh, UNDP. You also heard what Patrice said. No country have grown out of poverty due uh, to development assistance, but uh, due to investment. So how can you, and how do you see the UN and the international organizations in this context of the fourth industrial revolution, making sure that countries can leapfrog and that you don't see an increase um, uh, kind of uh, uh, differences uh, increasing between nations? Um, because we know in the, in the platform economy, it is a tendency that the winner takes it all. Thank you, Borg. And um, following on Patrice's comment, I think the, the statement that no country will develop because of aid, I think, is a very true one. I think where we are today, it, it is more that um, in an organization such as the United Nations Development Program, what we look for is how can we help countries overcome the constraints they face in actually realizing their objectives, whether it is Rwanda now, whether it is South Africa, or, or indeed any other country. And I think. The first thing we have to recognize is that, you know, enterprise is central. It drives, it invests, it expands markets. 
But we often neglect that the success of enterprise is also premised on, Paula spoke about it, for instance, with the digital data and, and rights legislation. It is on regulatory environments. It is on base infrastructure. It is on investment that allows a private sector economy or a market to emerge. And I think when we look at the global economy today, the first thing we have to recognize is we are at a very difficult point in time. There are countries who have resources, but actually, as of the beginning of 2022, there are 82 developing countries that are debt vulnerable, meaning they are one step away from actually essentially being in a very critical situation, declaring default. We are still in the midst of the fallout of a pandemic. We are just witnessing what the war in Ukraine is causing globally. So both from a basically a point of view of sharing lessons learned, one of the things that I think a program such as UNDP does is it connects in a rapidly moving global economy the best practices, the lessons that we learn. We don't all have to reinvent the wheel from the beginning, and therefore I think this is one of the vital things. And here I want to echo what you said, Patrice. One thing that has changed and which is fascinating is that innovation does not have its source or origin anymore in the traditional advanced economies, and the digital economy is a perfect example of that. When Kenya was already transacting on, um, on, on essentially an M-Pesa platform, there was still no uh, virtual cash payment system in most countries in Europe. Um, you can now essentially borrow money in the morning on your smartphone and repay it in the evening in Kenya uh, as a trader, um, which is unthinkable still in the economy of, of Europe uh, for most consumers. So I think the frontier has moved. I think innovation is moving and, you know, if you just look at also how Africa is beginning to invest across the continent, the IHUB in Nairobi having been bought up by Nigerian entrepreneurs, that network of investment that is happening, but, and here we come back to it, a digital economy is not just the fiber optic cable, it's not just the winner takes all first starter, it is actually building a digital ecosystem in which inclusion, and you alluded to that also, Paula and, and uh, the minister, are ultimately fundamental design elements. So how do you create public policy that uh, in a sense advances inclusion while at the same time creating the incentives for businesses to emerge? How do you um, retool an education system that allows school leavers to enter the labor market in a way that they can become successful players in the digital economy? How do you deal with a financial system that in most countries struggles in actually providing finance to startup businesses? It's the last thing they normally lend to, and yet these are the great champions in the digital economy. So let me just say, I think, in the way that we look at how we can accelerate, and there is, in my mind, no doubt, digital is transforming every aspect of our economies, of our daily lives, of the development pathways of nations. How do we make sure that um, those who don't necessarily have the means to quickly jump onto this are not left behind? Because this will be the great unequalizer of our age, if we're not careful, both globally speaking, but also within countries. And secondly, how do we create the kind of digital public goods and the digital regulatory framework that allows countries to thrive in a digital economy in a fourth industrial revolution um, by having all citizens be part of it? And I think these are some of the, let's say, design elements that every country is experimenting with and where we need to learn from one another because the future is being invented a thousand times over every day across the globe. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Akim, and um, we have seen this also on the company sides, uh, side. If you look at the 10 uh, most uh, highly valued companies globally with the highest market cap, uh, at least these statistics were, uh, was uh, correct uh, before uh, the energy crisis. I think there's been some um, recent changes, but if you looked at uh, the 10 most, um, the, the companies with the 10, uh, the 10 companies with the highest market cap, um, seven out of 10 were technology companies just a few months ago, and none of them existed 20 years ago. So that shows how fast things are happening. We saw it during also the COVID with the digital transformation I think what would have taken maybe a decade or two just happened in two years, the way we communicated with each other. And here I would like to have a follow-up um, question to you, Akim. You said that uh, the digital economy can be uh, also, if we don't do it uh, the right way, um, unfortunately, a great um, inequalizer. So it creates more uh, inequality. But at the same time, we have seen 
that um, uh, the remote work and where you work from is not so important anymore. So you can also um, sit in uh, Nairobi or in Abuja and, and doing uh, the job. So it's opening up a global um, work market in an uh, unparalleled way. Do you see currently the digital economy um, moving in the direction of giving opportunities for billions of people that did not have an opportunity before? Or is it today, uh, are you afraid it's go just gonna underline already uh, the uh, inequalities that we are seeing globally? I think the simple answer is both. I think the digital revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, carries within the seeds of breaking out of, for example, an inequality-driven um, um, century, if I may put it that way, in which success of some does not automatically turn into success for everyone. And I think we need to recognize, and for those who are interested, UNDP publishes every year the, the Human Development Report, and two years ago the Human Development Report focused precisely on this issue, and interesting enough, it identified climate change and digitalization as potentially the greatest drivers of reducing inequality, but also potentially increasing inequality, so as amplifiers. And I think much of that has to do with understanding that the way technology or also climate change affects people is defined by the context within which they live, by the ability to either become part of something or to simply be a victim, uh, for instance, of you know, extreme weather events, the, the ability to ensure yourself. Um, and I think what, you know, the extraordinary capacity of, of um, you know, digital frontiers to, first of all, um, explode into a marketplace. You know, the Amazons, the Airbnbs, the Ubers. Um, I think these are just um, examples of what it means that you may end up with very concentrated uh, commercial dominance in the marketplace. Now, we all know that competition is a fundamental element of well-functioning markets, but also of opportunity for access. So, I think there is an element of, of understanding that digital public goods needs to be part of a, of a digital ecosystem, because that way you can, in a sense, both enable entrepreneurial and uh, investment capacity to be mobilized, but you don't surrender the choices about a, a society's pathway simply to a technology outcome. Finding that balance is what good regulatory experiences have demonstrated. And um, in that sense, I think we still have to see, because you say billions of people have benefited. Yes, maybe not yet billions, because only half the world is really connected to the internet. But hundreds of millions have benefited from you know, being in a financial economy where they suddenly could actually exist. Remember, before digital, before the impressors of this world and other you know, fintech inventions, most people who did not have an address did not exist in a financial system, or did not have collateral. Now you have tens of millions of women being able to transact financially in our financial system. Unquestionably be um, a breakthrough. But access to technology, affordability, uh, these are some of the variables that will define whether this becomes the DNA of digitalization, or maybe, you know, leaving too many people behind. And that, I think, is still ahead of us. No worries, Paul. We have five minutes left of our panel, so I don't know who wants to be next to comment on what just Akim said. Um, Mr. Mohamed, and then I'll go to Paula, and then to Patrice. Yep. Uh, I think that <clears throat> digitization is impacting every aspect of life that we have, and if we had if we would have to talk about specifically businesses, I think the terminology of, of, onla uh, of uh, offline, online type of businesses is very appealing to me nowadays. Uh, the online world is growing, so we shouldn't leave the offline world. So the offline businesses actually need to be taken care of. They need to be brought to the level where they can be digitized, where they cannot actually do businesses based on new reality and based on a new uh, world or a fourth uh, industrial revolution that's, that's coming. So we should uh, not leave them behind. Thank you. Thank you. Paula? 
So very briefly, what, what I would want to add on that is there's definitely power in working together. And as we think about uh, the benefits of digital, uh, but also the fact that there's a risk that it will exacerbate these digital divides, one thing is for sure, when we look at the African continent, and I like what you started off with, Borge, looking at all the revolutions that have happened over time, I think there's an opportunity for Africa to leapfrog with this digital revolution. Uh, we don't have much of the legacy infrastructure that will in many ways uh, delay the transition that needs to happen uh, across the continent. You did talk about the Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution that is being launched in Rwanda, and I think it's, it's important to understand that it's not a Rwanda-specific center. It's a center that is meant to support efforts across the African continent when it comes to aligning and putting in place technology governance frameworks that are going to unlock the opportunities that we have on the continent. I very much like what Patrice said around, you know, with Africa, we have the capabilities and we need to build the right capabilities so that we are creating solutions uh, to some of the challenges that we're facing. And for that to happen, I'll just paint a picture, you don't want a fintech startup that has to go to 54 countries and have to experiment with different sets of regulations. And this is where I feel such a center will play a convening role where we can harmonize these different regulatory frameworks that will allow for those African unicorns that are going to be created to have the potential to scale across the African market. And so there's really power in working together, there's power in coordinating some of these mechanisms, and, and I think we're, the future is bright for the continent. No, thank you. And we also know that now with the establishment of the African free trade market is a huge opportunity, and are these regulations part of what is addressed? Because it will be one of the largest markets in the world now. It's like 1.3 billion people and, and growing very fast. And this is where we, we what are, what are the things that are being championed, and by the way, South Africa also ho hosts the other center. And so there's that collaboration that is happening between those centers to champion cross-border data sharing, um, you know, governance frameworks. Because as we think about, you know, e-commerce, the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, FinTech across the continent, you don't want to be dealing with different ways data is treated across the different parts of the continent. And so even through the CFTA, we're championing these cross-border data sharing frameworks that are going to unlock this opportunity. Thank you, um, uh, Paula. Uh, a lot of uh, optimism uh, related to your continent, uh, Patrice, but uh, we also know there are challenges. Well, uh, there will always be challenges. And, um, but I, I think what Akim said is absolutely correct. Uh, we have to make sure that there's inclusivity. One of our big problems with globalization over the last 20, 25, 30 years was the perception that it may indeed exacerbate, not just uh, globally in terms of rich countries and poor countries, but also on the continent, uh, in, in the continents, and in Af African continent, but also in the countries themselves that uh, whether it is through digitalization or whether it's through globalization that the rich becomes richer and uh, those who are either not educated or who don't have the skills and in fact with technological advancements comes uh, job losses, comes uh, those who don't have the skills that is required by the fourth industrial revolution, uh, their, their, their jobs take, get taken over by uh, uh, whether it's robotics or automation. But on a, on a different note, you, you're correct when you say you, there will always be challenges. Uh, you've, got, you've had two or three coups in Africa this year, which is something we haven't had for quite some time. And uh, Africa, in ways that uh, even John Hopkins and many of us cannot well, I'm not a scientist, but in ways that the scientists cannot fully explain, came out of the COVID-19 less, uh, I don't want to say destroyed, but uh, we were worried when COVID started because of the lack of infrastructure and medical facilities. Uh, I remember during the African uh, 
football competition in Africa, I, I was very, I was petrified whether we were going to allow 80,000 people in the stadium when you just had Omicron. And, uh, and we were on the verge of postponing it. But what really amazed me is when I went to the hospitals, because we thought that some of the governments were deliberately not telling the truth, were not giving the right numbers. But if you go to the hospitals and see whether there are people in the hospitals or not, it, it's incomprehensible. So indeed, Africa has, has not been as negatively impacted and maybe the answer, the scientists say it's maybe because we've had Ebola, we've had malaria, we've had uh, uh, AIDS, and over the years we've learned how to deal with it. But we should not say that because there's going to be a problem in one part of Africa that the success because of digitalization and the investments and the economic growth is now being, uh, uh, you know, we're going back to the problems of the past. Thank you, Patrice. Um, I'll go to you um, for the final uh, words. Uh, I can maybe uh, first uh, feel free to comment uh, on um, what is uh, said, but also maybe uh, two words about how the new technologies can support us and also uh, solving some of the other challenges that we are faced with. You mentioned uh, climate change, for example. Can we apply some of these new technologies, for example, AI in finding better solutions. For example, uh, breakthroughs when it comes to carbon capture and storage, uh, we know that uh, if we can make that uh, uh, commercially viable, uh, you can continue also with fossil fuels a bit longer because then you can capture the, uh, the carbon. Can we, for example, capture carbon out of the air in the future at the price? Uh, that the, the price for doing that is lower than the price of uh, climate change happening. So how can the technologies support us and how to make sure the te technologies uh, don't create more poverty but are and, uh, creating opportunities for uh, the millions of young people that will be joining uh, the workforce? Well, since it's supposed to be a brief answer, I, I just want to echo what my fellow three panelists have given as examples. I think these are the menus that um, will drive the, essentially the availability of technological frontiers that require both ingenuity, entrepreneurship, but also wise development pathways and choices. Because uh, as Patrice said, I mean, the the ability for, you know, for instance, automation. If there is one thing on the African continent uh, that is in high supply, it is a labor force. So is automation the antithesis of Africa's modernization, industrialization? Well, clearly not. The question is, can that new economy create jobs and can it prepare the labor market or can it prepare the school leavers? My point about training human capital for succeeding in that economy, because what not only is Africa connecting itself through the Africa free trade, continental free trade area, digitalization, um, the internet broadband allows African producers of knowledge, of services, of products to connect to a um, five and a half billion market outside the continent. And this is the extraordinary prospect we see today. So I would say, um, if you take this fourth industrial revolution, the technology, the digital frontiers, Every aspect of what we do today potentially can be done differently in the future. Um, I think, you know, just in the deployment, let me stay for a moment on the deployment of renewable energy, assessing the potentials, being able to identify where is the optimal place to invest in renewable energy infrastructure, but also have pay as you go schemes um, so that people, you know, are not prevented from using solar power because they don't have the means to invest in the panels. You know, we have systems today that allow you just on your cell phone to buy 10 cents worth of electricity this evening for your family and your children to do their homework. We still have, and we shouldn't forget that, hundreds of millions of people that don't even have access to electricity on the African continent, and about 900 million worldwide. Those are the people that if we leave them behind in these rapidly accelerating, technologically advanced um, pathways, they will become the people who will also unravel our societies. And I think in that sense, 
technology is as always a means to an end and not an end in itself, I would argue. And as long as we keep that in mind, we will make wiser decisions for its deployment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a great panel. I think we all learned a lot and uh, it is also ending at the time when we wanted it to continue. Uh, because there is a couple of questions I really would have liked to ask, but not all panels are like that. This panel has been great. Uh, really, thank you uh, to um, four great uh, speakers. Let's give them some applause. <laughs> and a special thank you, of course, to you and, uh, and the minister, and also to Qatar for hosting us um, here. So, good luck. Thanks.